Okay, then uh, we move on to the next uh, keynote speaker. And I think, uh, yes, okay, it's going to be introduced. We, it's in here, the, okay. So we move on to the next keynote speaker, which is, uh, uh, I dare to say, a well-known professor from uh, the Technical University of Dresden, is Gerhard Fettweiss, and is going to give us a view of uh, the evolution of GSM. Oh, no, 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 it's something else. Sorry about that. Okay, Gareth, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Luis. Yes, how about that? I will talk about GSM in three, four slides, but it'll take three, four slides to get there. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. Just to give you an idea, I, I love working with, uh, on research challenges, so I like working with companies. Um, we have, in the meantime, started 17 companies also out of my team, of which some have been sold. Some also have, we have two additional companies that we started, or my team started, uh, which are not technology, because the idea was basically, let's do something to earn money so that we can put down the money to start a company. Some of them, as I mentioned, were sold. Um, the most recent was sold last week. I'm not allowed to talk about it. Um, so there's yet another uh, transaction on that slide coming soon. Now, you know I've been talking about the tactile internet. And the idea is that if I touch and feel an object and I move it in front of my face, I want to have a one millisecond exactness. Otherwise, I don't know the position. So if I want to balance an object, if I want to do things like that, I really need this kind of sensitivity. If I want to make a phone call, 100 millisecond latency is good enough. Now the question is obviously, where are we now? And obviously this is an old slide of mine with showing my dear friend and colleague Frank Fitzek, who has the goggles on. And what you can see is that we can change the latency in the goggles. And this is a nice experiment. I also used this just last Friday with the German government to tell them and explain them about what is 5G. And if we crank up the latency to 150 milliseconds, you'll see there's no chance for, uh, for catching the ball. However, if we jam it down to the smallest latency, in this case, the smallest latency is around 10, 15 milliseconds. You see the person catches it with a little displacement. This ball is not traveling at 10 meters per second, a hard object like this would do. This ball was traveling maybe at seven or something meters per second. So one millisecond is 1.5 to two centimeters. Having said that, we know a lot of things are going to happen. We heard about 5G AA. We heard that this is going to be great. Obviously, we can get rid of traffic lights. Cars can just zoom around. We will have a personal bubble as we walk and cross a street and no car is going to hit us. And if we install the right cameras, we can also detect objects as frogs and they can happily cross and f find the pond. <laughs> Having said that, the question is, is that all? No, obviously we just heard also about 5G ICA I A, or whatever it's called. Um, the industry association. So obviously going from a factory where Henry Ford's assembly line can copy very expensive things fairly cheaply, but copy paste, everything is the same. We want to have industry 4.0. We want to have unit size one, meaning everybody wants to have something completely individualized. So we need robots whizzing on the ceiling, on the floor and going along. This is going to be a job machine. This is one thing I always try to say if I talk to politicians, because then who is interested in going to Amazon? We want to go to our design assistants in boutique stores in downtowns. We want to go there, get some help, because if we start ordering something and it doesn't fit or looks bad, there, we need help. So we're going to look at a virtual mirror. We're going to touch some fabric and it instantaneously in the virtual mirror will change to what we want. We can individualize our car, our whatever objects, our sofas, you name it, you got it. The sky is the limit. And the cost of that due to this individualized manufacturing going back from the assembly line to the assembly station will be marginal, the additional cost. Having said that, we see this is going to be a revolution. I truly believe that. 
just this is just the addressable market that I put together for um, the CEOs of Deutsche Telekom and Vodafone in 2016, Vittorio Colau and Tim Hötkes at the time, uh, telling them what is the addressable market for an operator in Germany alone. Then there are new applications like agriculture, like drones, like packet deliveries and drones and construction, huge industries that also will be completely modified and changed and revolutionized by this making an infrastructure for robotics, for moving objects. If we say an operator has about 10% of the value chain, we have to multiply by 10. If we say Germany is about 5% of world GDP, we have to multiply by 20. This would be an increase of 20 uh, trillion US dollars, the largest industry in history in GDP. Now, Maybe I have a 3db error here or there, obviously, but still, this is a major thing that is coming. To do that, to tackle that, we built this 5G lab Germany. I called out and said, let's do something. Um, and we called out to industry, and industry has also been happily joining us uh, with a minimum ticket of 100,000 euros. We have four, far more than 3 million euros a year, where the industry is really supporting us, our vision of joining together 22 professors working on this from applications all the way to semiconductors to antennas to hardware. Having said that, this is great, but look at this. Now I'm going to talk about GSM. 1G was voice. Bad idea. 2G fixed it. 3G was data. Bad idea. 4G fixed it. 5G is Tactile internet, remote controls, we need 60 to fix it. Think about that. And now I'm going to give you eight reasons why. Let's first talk about data rates. So obviously, if we look at data rates, what is going to be delivered is not really interesting. Why? It's the same data rate as 802.11 AD. Who has 802.11 AD? Hardly anybody. It's a wireless HDMI data rate of up to 10 gigabit per second. Who needs that? Uncompressed. We need way more. The applications that are waiting for us are faster, are higher. We need to go and stretch and go beyond. So we have to stretch beyond that. Why? The application that is luring and looking around the corner is virtual reality. If you go and talk to Disney Studios, I did this three years ago, spend a day with Disney, with Facebook, with Google, the VR teams. And in, I said, guys, why is VR not taking off? The goggles you have are so poor. If you put them on, you can see every pixel. It's like a VGA screen. Who wants a VGA screen today when you watch a movie? So why do we have that? And the problem is that if we look at our pixels on the side of us, we have 180 degree vision, angle of view. These pixels determine our stability. So they are linked with our organ in the ear and they need to be synchronous at one millisecond for you not to mess up the system. So that's why, for example, in 3D movies, if you watch a 3D movie of Disney, you can see they have a problem that the latencies are not synchronized yet good enough. And that's why they fog up the sides so that they don't have too much of a cleaning job later on in the movie theater. So really, VR, if you do the calculations and you say we want 8K resolution, but that's a 30 degree angle of view, we want 180 and we don't want a screen like this, we want a screen like this. And you do the calculations, you end up at around 35, not terabits, yes, terabits per second. If you say now 1,000 fold compression, which is the best compression we can think of today, um, then we end up at around 35 gigabit per second. So we need at least 100 gigabit phi to handle this kind of a system. Having said that, there's a lot to be done. Obviously, forget about OFTM. For these kind of data rates, the A to D converter is gonna burn a hole in your pocket. So, I've talked about that previously. What is then the next problem? 
massive latency reduction. The question is if we have an edge cloud controlling a sensor and actuator, what is the latency that we can achieve in 5G? Not one millisecond. If you really go wireless to wireless over the edge cloud, we're about at this kind of a latency, around five to seven milliseconds. And that is the stability you can create with five to seven milliseconds, yes? And this thing topples over if we turn it up to eight. So what we really need is this kind of precision. This is not one millisecond, this is EtherCAT. You can see the cables laying there. Uh, it's a standard designed by Beckhoff Automation, um, worldwide used. This is 125 microsecond. That is the real-time clock industry automation, factory automation works at, and then you can make these kind of things happen. 125 millis uh, microseconds, whoosh, we're far away from that. Next problem, security. If we look at our security issue, we want to make this happen. Now, you're sitting in one of these cars, and with the current software system, what do we have? Anybody can know where you are. Yes, you have WhatsApp open, you have Google open, you have Facebook open, you have this open, whatever open. Everybody knows where you are. So you're a nice target. Let's say for most of us, it's not such an issue, but for many more important people, it is an issue. So, or if you just had some fight in the family. Uh, so this is not what we want. You want your terminal to be completely private. I don't know what is the solution. I'm just drawing a picture here. A picture is that we might need some kind of a barrier skin, possibly in the edge clouds, possibly somewhere else. Don't get me wrong, I have no solution yet. But we need some kind of an anonymization. Do we need to know where every car is on planet Earth? No, not every car. We need to know that a car is there, but not which car it is. So that's the difference. So possibly we need to terminate the IP connection right there at the barrier skin and then reinstantiate a new one so that we can do traffic management but don't know who is in the cars and the objects. However, the edge cloud needs to know everything. The weight, the authentication, acceleration, braking behavior of the cars and whatever all. And any kind of other object, a robot in the factory. Next thing is obviously then we need to build a hardware operating system, secure real-time solution. Otherwise we get another spectrum meltdown or DIN attack. Right now, you have chip companies building processors, you have operating system companies building operating systems. To really build a secure real-time operating system, this has to be jointly done. Then we can build a secure edge cloud and we have to make this also reliable and completely uh, secure and private over the air. This is a challenge which in this way has possibly, we need a new architecture. Having said that, I talked to the German government and they gave me the opportunity and the obligation to start a new research institute that does exactly this. The Barkhausen Institute, where we do cloud hosting, secure boot operating system, connectivity, etc., etc. Why the in Dresden? Well, let's put it this way. I think we're not so bad in wireless communication. And by the way, the biggest operating system on planet Earth the one that runs on Amazon Web Services is 100% designed out of Amazon Web Services sitting in Dresden, growing to 400 people. The, the German Secret Service and government runs their operating system with another company sitting in Dresden. There's a lot of know-how there as well. So we have, and then we still have the whole chip industry. So that makes it really nicely viable to do this kind of thing in Dresden. Now the next question is, Alta reliable, what is that? Reliability means we want to make these kind of things happen, yes? So this is, uh, you see the Japanese movie, uh, not movies, Japanese news uh, on the right hand side, you see the German news on the left hand side of our demo that we had just a couple months ago uh, at the 5G Connect in Dresden, 
Um, and you can see really that you can manipulate things at this low latency, and it has to be reliable for these kind of operations. Otherwise, you might burn your fingers. Having said that, however, 3GPEP made a mistake. I also did that mistake. Um, because we always considered reliability to be something considered packet error rate. After working with KUKA, with Franca, with ABB, with Rexroad, with all these different companies now for quite some years, I have to come to realize we completely didn't get it. Reliability is not about packet error rate. They are happily fine with a packet error rate of 10%. The problem is contiguous packets lost because the control loop obviously has a loop filter. And the filter bandwidth is much smaller than the sampling rate. That's how you build control systems, if you remember from the time studying controls. So only if three packets are lost in a row in the KUKA robot or five in a Franca robot, do these things start acting up and go into fail-safe mode. So it's about number of packets can, that are contiguously lost. Now, I have had Nice discussions with Ericsson. And just a couple of weeks ago in Iceland, again, Ericsson proposed a nice solution, which makes no sense to this industry, to controls. It's, they say, let's just do a little bit of hybrid ARQ. And since we have three contiguous packets, two packets time, we can do a little hybrid ARQ, and then we send out the packet that was lost. Bad idea. If you have a highly spinning control object, and you want to set the right uh, magnet, turn it on, so that the rotor continues, and the ro the, this rotor has t turned further already, and suddenly you send a packet one instance too late, you're going to break the system. There are papers on that in controls. Never, ever think of sending a packet too late. It's better to drop a packet than sending it too late. Complete wrong concept. So we have to look at this. There is a whole theory coming from controls, actually from the moon mission from the 60s. Um, on probabilities, time durations, we have to look at availability, interrupt availability, uh, interval reliability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these different aspects and build a system. That is a very different proposition than what we have been doing in 3GPP. Packet error rate of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 8 is wrong for this application. Next thing is, if we do then start understanding what control really needs, then we have to look into these kind of systems. Look at this is platooning of cars. This is obviously Lego Mindstorm, uh, a video some, most of you or some of you have probably have seen already, where students, eighth graders from high school came to us and put this together, they all follow this track and keep a constant distance. No, they don't. There is no constant distance. They edge a little forward, a little back. That's exactly what you do in a car when you're driving. You never keep a constant distance. And if you're too close to the car, the car in front of you might jam the brakes while you are accelerating, then you overreact and then we have chaos. You can show this nicely here by putting in this card box. And you can see that the first car does stop, the second car as well, but the second oscillator starts oscillating, the third oscillates a little more. As you see, this is what happens if Tesla and Google take over the road. Maybe not so comfortable. Yes, and then when I was visiting Andrea Goldsmith just in December, going heading down 280 to Stanford University from San Francisco, there was a big crash on 101, five Teslas crashed into each other. Ha ha. I know exactly why. So what we really need is an infrastructure to connect these. Why? This is what we believe because then we can make these systems more stable. So we did some examinations. If you talk to Bosch, for example, they say, well, if you go at 50 miles per hour and five meters distance is what you should do so that you get the nice wind drag. You need about five millisecond latency, and if you can then connect these systems, then it's stable. And I said, how did you find out? We did tests. We did the math. So you can actually look at this from a control theory point of view. Um, 
you have basically this kind of a, a leader and follower model. You can build this, and if they are connected in a wireless link, the right stability comes in. You see a little disturbance. The black line is the first guy that changes its velocity from 120 to uh, 117 kilometers per hour. And uh, the whole thing explodes in your face in the normal system, but if you connect them with five milliseconds latency, then it becomes stable. We can show at which speed, at which distance, whatever stability comes in. So we really need to co-design communication and control, not just packet air rate, forget about that. Resilience, what is resilience? This is not reliability. Resilience is what? Well, let's have a look at it. What we want to have is campus networks. We want an intersection crossing A, intersection B, intersection C. They all want to have their own little campus network and control an intersection. It's not going to be one operator controlling it. And then if you are in a car of another, connected with another operator, you're going to not be able to use that intersection. So we need little local networks that are able to do that. Factories will have their campus networks. Farms will have their campus networks. We will have a massive deployment of these kind of campus networks. As we have that, what is the problem? If we have this kind of a wireless campus network A, we also have a wireless campus network B sitting next door. There is provision, manual provision along the borders in Europe so that the operators talk to each other so they don't interfere enough, uh, too much. So that's basically done on the borders. But that's by talking and texting and sending emails and documents. We need an automated system. Then we need to make sure that we don't have some hidden node challenge where we have sort of the orange um, handset or terminal trying to talk to uh, uh, its base station, its access point with a non-line of sight, but as a line of sight to a terminal sitting in the wireless campus network A and killing its connection just saturating the amplifier. And finally, guys, you can buy a GNU radio for very little money. You can buy a horn antenna for very little money. All you need to do is take that GNU radio, write your own little Python code, do a spectrum scanner, find out what is that antenna, that base station antenna actually, what frequency is it using, and then just jam it. Then some people say, oh, that, uh, that we'll have massive MIMO, we'll go and just if Once it's saturated, there's no beam you can move. That base station is down. It can be done today. Nobody does it. Why? Because you don't see an effect. A couple drop calls, data rate goes down, you have to reconnect to the neighboring base station, all not that, that an issue. But if you can start stopping the factory from making noise so that you can get some sleep, or stopping the road traffic because you want that intersection to be sort of blocked, then the one or the other person might spend the $99 to make this happen. We need this provision, we forgot it completely. The tactile internet idea is not going to make it in a wide sense if we have no solution. A complete second, not only a network management lane, layer, but a whole uh, surveillance, cognitive radio surveillance layer, actually finding out what is happening, doing geolocation analysis, etc., of possible interferes and all these things. Another thing, energy efficiency. A big topic. Right, Didier? A big topic. In 2007, I sat down once and projected that uh, by 2020, possibly earliest, 2030 latest, the energy consumption of ICT will be as high as a complete power grid of 2007. So I was able to convince the German government to give me a 160 million euro project. That was a gigantomanic project, Cool Silicon. And then we did all kinds of European projects, and many others did also projects. It was not only me coming up with this challenge, many others came up with this idea at the same time. So, um, and we made it happen. Look at it. The energy consumption flattened out and was not the dashed line, the projection. That was the energy efficiency. You, due to hyperscale data centers and chip innovation. 
Now we design 5G. Ah, there's a problem. This is what um, Andr Anders Andre has projected. He works in the meantime for Huawei. Uh, this was in Nature. And we can see we will go in data centers from 200 terawatt hour to 3,000 and in networks from 300 terawatt hours to 4,000. That's 5G. All those little edge cloud things using commercial off the shelf and just softwareizing everything is a fantastic idea for functionality, the worst idea on planet Earth for energy efficiency. Using ASICs is great, but getting rid of ASICs and using commercial off the shelf, COT servers. So is this the end of softwareization? If that is true, 5G is toast. So I'm not saying 5G is toast, don't get me wrong, but we're going to have to work on that ASAP. Also ready for 5G advanced or whatever we're going to call 5G, 5.5G. Scalability, another issue. This is sort of, if we look at data rate in uh, bits per second over latency and span sort of where we really need to go in the 6G plane, this means we're spanning 10 orders of magnitude. This is not a one chip solution. And we will need 5G to understand that. Where are the pockets in this 6G throughput latency kind of range? Where are the pockets where the different applications fit in such that we can actually tune the system to these kind of pockets, design the right silicon solution and the operators also the right obviously um, service model. We've been working on this and we think there's a scale of our architecture that we're presenting in multiple conferences this year that will able, be able to do that. We call it Kachel, meaning tile in German, um, making sure that there is a tiled fashion where we easily can scale software, hardware and to adapt to everything. And finally, not finally, second finally, rural development. Connecting the planet to the internet. We have more than 7 billion people, only 3.5 billion people have internet. And the number of people that have internet will be going down, not 10 kilobit per second GPRS. Yes, okay, that everybody will have. But if you have edge, you cannot even open a Google search web page anymore. Yes, on your phone, if you have edge connection, forget it. So how do we make sure that the new services that need these bandwidths are delivered not with smaller and smaller and smaller cells? This is a challenge uh, which is specifically addressed by the IEEE Future Networks Initiative. And I think we need to attack this. It is not only serving Europe, it is serving really every pocket of planet Earth to make the Earth equal. Otherwise, we just have people trying to move around and get to where life is good. So looking at this, in conclusions, this is sort of the 5G kitchen. Yes, my nice little tactile internet idea implemented by a Northern European network operator. And what we can see is your kitchen will be great. Yes, look at this. Everything fully automated. You will make sure that you, the icing goes onto this system. You will want to put your mouth in the way so that you get those M&Ms right into your mouth. But it's a cleaning job. Not like Disney Studios, but it's still a cleaning job. So having said that, what is 5G? It's this. This was one of the best inventions on planet Earth, a car. The first car was a carriage with a third wheel and a crank to turn the wheel. That's it. 5G is LTE, new radio we can call it. It's not really new, it's that new, it's basically just a little bit changed. It's 4G radio, plus plus, with massive MIMO and network slicing. Network slicing is the motor strapped underneath. What we drive or what we wish to drive are these kind of cars. That's the difference. So is 5G bad? No, this is a fantastic invention that, and that company still exists. 
but it's just a beginning because we need not those droopy, poor leaves that desperately need water. We need the rocket launching. Yes, this is not a copyright. This is just my own little 6G logo. Don't get anything wrong. So to round this up, I said we need data rates clearly beyond 10 gigs. We have to look at latency reduction at one and below one millisecond, security privacy. We have to think of reliability in a different way. Uh, we have to understand that reliability and resilience are two complete different kind of things. Um, we have to increase the energy efficiency and we have to do scalable solution mapping, find out by experimenting with 5G, where are those big parks, pods where the, we can really earn money. And finally, we have to address rule coverage. And thereafter, let's have a look at this. Electronics thereafter is currently focusing on the terahertz gap. How can we close the terahertz gap? Yes, we can use optical systems to get down to about 10 terahertz and electronics to get up to about 300 gigs, possibly one terahertz. And there's a gap in between. But what we really want are these kind of systems of the future where we, even if we're 88 and need a walker or like this guy who is actually paralyzed from here downwards, and he can stand up by having sensors and has his exoskeleton turned on, but he needs this terahertz radar that can really make sure an imaging to make sure that you are moving next to the Chinese vase and not killing that Ming vase, or that it also takes you down the stairs precisely and these kind of things. So we will be able to do radar imaging and spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is like smelling the materials of us around us at a very different thing rate and a very different granularity than we have today. So I truly believe there's even life beyond 6G because 6G is a fixer of 5G and then we will really have an ambient internet where we can understand the ambience around us. If we are suddenly having a plate in front of us and we're allergic to peanuts, we know right away our sensors will be able to tell us. We can smell the paint in the wall, we can find out everything and have a complete different environment that we're going to be living in. To see this vision happen and see what's going on, come to the 5G World Forum, which is on September 30th to October 2nd. Uh, Michael Bolle, the Chief Digital Officer of Bosch, is the General Chairman. And enjoy this. We have a ton of CEOs, CTOs, and other people coming, also giving nice presentations. And with this, I want to tell you, there's a ton of research to be done. It's not about saying 5G is bad. It's just that the research ahead is fantastic. So you did talk about the evolution of GSM. Yes. <laughs> OK, so again, the floor is open for questions. So anyone? Yes, there is a question out there. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Do, although I'm very agree with you with the wish list that you put for 5G and 6G and beyond. However, last 10 years we were observed many uh, cool technologies and research outputs that died just because we failed to make it affordable. How do you think that uh, this cursed on uh, tactile internet that makes the whole networks and terminals extremely expensive could be addressed? Any thoughts on it? Yes, yeah, so if we look at actually the, the cost in terms of transistors per bit per second. Sorry, that's my measure of cost, okay? So in GSM, we had about 10 times more transistors for da for, per data rate than in 3G. That was the real true innovation of CDMA, is going from an exponentially growing equalizer to a linearly growing equalizer where we just set a number of fingers in the rake receiver. And that made 3G possible to get this to these data rates with a Viterbi equalizer, we would never have been able to do this. Um, then we found out CDMA is a really bad idea and we moved to OFDM. 
in OFDM, we have a cyclic prefix, and the FFT basically is a log of the cyclic prefix, and the cyclic prefix determines, is determined by the delay spread. So now the delay spread only is not exponential, not linear, but only logarithmically determining the transistors that we need. And this is continuing with 5G. So the 5G new radio, if you look at the chip cost and its implementation, that's not the issue. I truly believe the issue is on the edge cloud. And there it's less so much the cost of actually deploying these servers, but can we finance running these servers just from an energy point of view? And that is something that truly needs to be, we need a ton of innovation. I'm sure we're going to come up with ideas as a research community. We're engineers, right? We're there to solve these issues. So I've, I've, but I just want to point out, I truly believe an issue is coming. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Okay, so you have mentioned about the security and privacy issues, so it is was an uh, interesting thing. So how about the, think about the GDPR issues? Can we, how much share about the GDPR issues by using the, your proposed way? So what I truly believe is, and that's one of our big research problems that we're doing at the Backhausen Institute, is that my geolocation is probably the most challenging problem. And that is not covered by GDPR. Yeah? By GDPR just is about copyrights and these things and not about these new kind of properties like my geolocation. If you have Bluetooth turned off on your phone, those guys selling the phone still turn on Bluetooth in receive mode to make sure that they can see beacons or have Wi-Fi on to make sure that they can listen to Wi-Fi access points, even though you're not transmitting, you're listening to them to do indoor localization and uh, navigation, to improve your navigation. So what we see today is that these kind of things most likely will not be allowed anymore because we have to make sure that somehow our, I think our geolocation is something that we have to own ourselves and we need to know exactly whom we give it to and whom we don't give it to. For example, there's no reason why Google Maps is on your phone. It could be just running in the edge cloud, right? That's one solution. And all you see is the video of it, some updates once in a while. Uh, when you look and touch and screen, whatever, you can just download from the Edge Cloud. And the Edge Cloud is sitting there with its geolocation and keeps it completely anonymous to the Google server farm where you actually are, but just does the local stuff for you. So that's why we have to think of this kind of service architecture. And we need rules and regulations. I see that the internet is similar to Gutenberg's invention of um, print. Yes, when print was invented, the Catholic Church was suddenly challenged with Luther. We had uh, the farmer revolutions, the Medici stopped functioning, etc. So, so Europe fell apart and then found out rules, how to set up a system again, and then invented democracy as we know it now to, to cope with it and journalism as we know it now. Now with the internet, we have a similar situation. And with the tactile internet, it's going to be even worse. Yes. And so we have to think about what are certain properties that we have that we are allowed to give away or that we should never give away and these kind of things and what are things that should be kept dear to our heart. That, but that's a very philosophical, <laughs> but I truly believe it's a challenge. Okay, uh, one last question. We still have a couple of minutes. No, okay, there's one here. How do I see the intelligence in 6G? And how do you see intelligence on radio also? So what I do believe is what we need is, so if we want to do, 
So the, the base stations basically have to have three functionalities. One is to deliver the service. One is to run the network management system to make sure which base station has crashed and to reboot them. And the third part is to actually find out who is intruding or interfering with whom and where's the geolocation of this. Is this a malicious attack or is this just some accident or whatever all. And to be able to monitor that and find out this, there's a lot of AI if you're talking about AI. So that is sort of the AI part where we're going to see a ton of AI being used in this third level of cognitive radio interference management system that we will be introducing in the next generation systems. I truly believe that. Now, um, the general in intelligence, I don't know. We will see. Okay, I think uh, we need to go to the coffee break. We have seen the logo for 6G. Have you seen it? Have you noticed that? <laughs> so, Gerard, you have an open invitation for UCNC 2029 <laughs> to address 7G on the condition that you bring the logo. Is aye, it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> okay, Gerard, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much.